Last week, we started our teaching series on the core values. Last week and the coming weeks, I'll be highlighting each one individually, kind of going in and giving some of the teaching and understanding about those. Last Sunday, I did it in a format where I took scripture references and embedded them into the service itself. I will continue doing that today as well. Today, we look at discipleship. Now, I don't know about y'all, but when I hear the word discipleship, the most natural thing that my brain does is it automatically thinks of the original 12 men Jesus called to follow him. And when they did, they left their homes. They left their families. They left their livelihoods to follow Jesus wherever he went and whatever he did. In Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 25, Jesus says to them all, If any of you want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will save it. What does it profit then if they gain the whole world but lose or forfeit themselves? Peter, Andrew, James the Elder, and John left their fishing business to follow Jesus. Matthew had a lucrative job as a tax collector. He left that and followed Jesus. And while we do not know the occupations of Philip, the other James, Thomas, Bartholomew, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, what we do know is that they dropped whatever it was they were doing and all that they knew and answered the call to follow Jesus. Now today in this world, I believe that Jesus still has disciples among us, some in this very house. I also believe that not every believer lives a consistent life as a disciple. I know there are times that I don't. A disciple by definition, and you may want to write this down, is someone who has made a wholehearted commitment to follow Jesus our Savior. That's the Christian definition of a disciple. This definition, which the original 12 and many others today employ, can be viewed as a radical shift in life. But when we choose to live the Christian life, that's exactly what we're doing. Sometimes being a disciple of Jesus is looked upon and feared as something so radical something that calls for us to change our fundamental nature, that it scares us, that we reject it. Or we try to reinterpret it and morph it so it looks more like the world around us that has cultured and mentored us instead of allowing us to be the new creation that coming to Jesus, passing through the waters of baptism, actually generates. As a people of God, if we uphold to the value that every person is called to have a relationship with a loving God through Jesus Christ, our Savior, then it is a natural assumption that the journey of discipleship begins with a declaration of faith, going through the waters of baptism, and continuing with an ongoing pilgrimage throughout our entire life. The core values that this body worked on the core values that this body voted into place. Uphold, promote, and call us to be radical. But again, why does this intimidate us so much? I have personally read 25 books on the subject of discipleship. I have them all except three at my home. I have reviewed over 50 websites in the last two weeks talking about discipleship. Some of them give really sound teaching. Some of them are so weak and loose the wind will blow right through them. 
But none of them stop and explain why we have been born and raised in a post-American culture and struggle with a fundamentally elementary requirement to the Christian faith to grow as a disciple. And as I began to reread some of my author, favorite authors on the subject of discipleship, Ron Sider, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Frederick Buechner, and I went over some of the passages where Jesus introduced the lifestyle of discipleship through the parable of the Good Samaritan, the parable of the sower, the encounter with the rich young ruler. What I began to discover was that the practice of being a disciple, someone who gives their whole heart to follow the teachings of a master, was an expected cultural practice of the ancient world. But it is a completely foreign practice of ours in today's modern society. Our normal culture practice is kind of like what it's like to drive down a multi-lane highway. Now, the, most, the largest multi-lane highway I've ever driven on was five lanes, and that was going into Kansas City, Kansas. And everyone's in their lane. Everyone's going their speed. You got the slow people all the way over on the right, which some people call the morons. And you got the people all the way over on the left in the speed lane, which some people will call the maniacs. Who's the moron? Who's the maniac? It depends on what lane you're in and what speed you're driving. We all go at our own pace from point A to point B, trying to get what we need done, done, get to where we need, go, go. But there is always invariably one person in that middle lane driving slower than everybody, forcing everyone else to go around them. And they get a number of gestures, words mouthed through them through the glass of the other vehicles. It's not always a pretty sight. And the person driving in the middle lane is either totally oblivious or has such a look of consternation that I dare you to make me go faster. And the world goes around them. When it comes to discipleship, how do we drive in it? What lane do we take? Do we recognize that sometimes if we're going too fast, we need to slow down and move over? Or sometimes we're going too slow and we just need to speed up and we need to move over? Or are we the stubborn type that just sits in that middle lane and, you know, stick the world that can just go around us? I'm going to do it my own way. Well, those folks think they're great disciples. But if you read the examples that Jesus gave, what it means to be someone who gives their life and follows and allows themselves to change and grow, the answer is invariably, I'm sorry. No, you're not. The lawyer to who the parable of the Good Samaritan was written, the Pharisees to whom the parable of the sower was written, even the rich young ruler, did a perfectly great spot-on drive of being those middle lane drivers. They came to challenge and say, yep, I'm willing to hear what you have to say, but don't expect me to change anything about me. If we ask Jesus to come into our hearts, if we look forward to grow in God's presence, if we seek to be vessels of his light and his glory and grace, how on earth can we stay exactly who we are through all the years of our lives and expect others to come to know the love of a beautiful and wonderful God if we are not letting them see how it changes us, how it's made manifest within us? I don't have the answer to that other than being a disciple is foreign and counter to the culture of the world that we live in. For discipleship says, lay down who and what you are and allow yourself to be molded and created in a discipline that glorifies God, while the world says, go out and look out for number one. Go to school, but take that knowledge and apply it however you like to. If you don't have a career path that you've been, that you've been trained for, go and create your own. If you don't like the people that you're working with, go work for yourself. And hey, if you don't want to do any of it, 
play the lottery on a regular basis and hope you win, because then you don't have to be loyal to anyone or anything. Our world perpetuates this. And when we sit there and say, well, we stop and give ourselves to God and put him first, the world goes, what? They don't understand it because being a disciple calls for an element of humility, not a position of strength, pride, and arrogance. No. We use the words. We come to church. We come before the cross. A sign of form, a, a visual idea of humility. Mark chapter 8, verse 34, Jesus says it very, very plainly. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Discipleship is the means of learning how to do that. Discipleship is the means of learning how to be okay with that. Discipleship is the means of being an example and a teacher so others can come and do the same. In other words, we stop putting the desires and the pressures to give to those that are put on us by our friends, the marketing of the world around us, the selfishness of our egos, and we allow ourselves to become like Jesus, where our Savior becomes the most important thing in our lives. Discipleship begins with a declaration of faith. It leads to the waters of baptism where we face, for when we face trials and temptations, through discipleship we have learned how to recognize the peace which passes all understanding and allow the God who created and gifted us to not merely take care of us, but to carry us through. The call of discipleship is to have a personal relationship with Jesus where we seek to know him on a regular basis. Discipleship is responding to that call and following the teachings of Jesus. And then discipleship is taking what we have learned and share it with others to make other disciples. When we answer the call of Jesus and allow our Heavenly Father to have the place of priority in our lives, that's number one. Number two and three fall into place rather easily. In responding to the call of discipleship, we seek to know and enjoy the Master. But to do this, we must learn about Jesus by reading his word, the Bible. You're not going to get it in a graphic novel. And you're not going to get it in novels that are written that are called parahistorical fiction. Stories about ancient times that are set in that time period and have one snippet of truth, but the rest of it is the author's imagination. We believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior, but not responding to the call, but in responding to the call of discipleship, we seek to believe in him each and every day. We summon to follow Jesus through his teachings parables, interactions with a diversity of people and are enlightened by the amazing power being shared with us through the miracles he performed. If you want to learn about who and what Jesus is, you read the Gospels. You want to learn how it caught on fire and sped, spread throughout the Roman Empire? You read Acts. You want to read how those church, you want to understand how those churches struggled and how Peter and Paul helped them through it? You read the epistles. You want to know what's waiting for us at the end of the journey? Read Revelation. It's all right there. But discipleship in all of this comes at a cost. Probably one of the greatest authors who ever explained that was Diedrich Bonhoeffer, The Cost of Discipleship. And if you haven't read it, I recommend it. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was, was an Anglican priest. He was very young. He was already a prolific writer, a phenomenal scholar and theologian. 
But because he and his parish were helping Jewish refugees, he got arrested by the Nazi party. He was imprisoned in one of their concentration camps, and he died there. If he had lived, he probably would have been one of the most influential prolific writers of the time. But when he talks about the cost of discipleship, he not only understood it academically, but he understood it personally, for it took his life in uplifting and caring for others. Greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends, that's discipleship. As human beings, we cannot do this on our own. We cannot simply just say, okay, Jesus, fill me, show me, and automatically know. We are too weak in our mind and our body and spirit and are too easily distracted. I know for myself, when it comes to my time of study, if I'm at home, I close the door, I lock it. And it takes about two or three rounds of my wife or son, Paul! dad, and I finally say, I'm in study, and they go, oh, and they leave me alone. I cannot have distractions, because while I'm reading and I'm into something, if I see something happening off in my peripheral vision, somehow my eyes kind of track towards it, and it's like, oh, it's a bird at the window. Okay, what kind of bird is that? Where did it come from? How many times an hour does it have to flap its wings in order to have enough lift and, and go for a while? And does it always sing in key? And that's kind of ugly right foot that that sucker's got. And I mean, that's what my brain does. I have an inquisitive mind. So I have to have, be intentional in my focus to block out times in my week. There are times that you'll call in here sometimes to the church and Kelly will say, I'm sorry, he's busy. I'm in study. I cannot be disturbed. I have to give that focused amount of time so that I can be enriched and to grow. It's a cost because, well, I don't always want to work that hard. But when we do, there are definite benefits. Benefits of grace, benefits of peace, benefits of understanding, benefits of knowing that we have the confidence to face whatever the world throws at us. In John chapter 15, verses 1 through 11, Jesus is speaking, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you, just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. You can't do it on your own and by your own power. You've got to open yourself and rely on God to get there. Jesus goes on to say, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I am them bear much fruit, because apart from me, you can do nothing. You want to have miracles unfold in your life? The hopes that you have for this church to turn around and grow and to bring in folks, you think you're going to do that on your own? It only happen if you give yourselves to God and let God take you to the places that you need to go, not where you not want to go. That's discipleship. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Here's the peace that really pushes me. I have said these things so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. So the hour and a half that I sat next to the Clinton River next to Yates Cider Mill yesterday and while I sat there and relaxed and listened to my wife and son pick on each other and saw the kayakers go by and what we started calling you know, Michigan alligators, those are the big logs that just stay in the water and just keep swirling round and round that that wasn't a source of my joy. 
Well, if you look at it strictly as a setting, yes. But if you look at it in the sense that God allowed the time for my family to go there, God created that space so I could soak up and absorb the creation and be refreshed, then yes. It all depends on how we look at it. It all depends on our mindset, how we've allowed our mindset to be programmed. Jesus is telling his disciples of the first century these things, and I think they have as much relevant then as they do today. Even though he is no longer physically in this world, he will nevertheless carry on his life and ministry through us, his chosen people of God, that have come to him through his blood, passed through the waters to share it with others. And from this we grow to learn and understand when we, are, when our lives are, we put our lives into his hands, that his are the hands that still the water and calm the seas. That through the Holy Spirit, Jesus will live and flow through our hearts, our hands, as we strive to share and, sh- share and serve his love in this world. Now, the call of discipleship does not come without struggles. If I'm going to talk about discipleship, I might as well talk about all of it. When we seek to live like Jesus, we will stand out and we will be rejected by the world. We will have friends that we've known for our lifetimes, family that we've known longer, who will turn their backs on us. And thoughts and activities that were once a source of joy for us will no longer leave us satisfied. One of the most significant things I noticed in an individual a number of years ago is they were not only the church gossip, they were the town gossip. They gave themselves to God. And I heard her one time at a potluck sitting with a bunch of her chatty Kathy friends. If there's anyone Kathy here, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend you. That's the term I grew up using. And they sit there and start going, and just start tearing about and gossiping everything. And I watched her sit there getting more and more uncomfortable. She did not want to engage because she wanted to do things that built up the kingdom, not tear it down. I finally walked over to her and kind of went, you want to go sit somewhere else? And she looked at me and I went, I know you're not happy here. She says, but these are the people that I know. These are my friends. I've known them for decades. I said, I know. But those relationships are supposed to build you up and make you feel better, not make you feel uncomfortable and f- small. She said, where should I sit? I said, well, there's a new family over there. Why don't you go sit and say hello to them? And She did. She became their adopted grandmother. They were new to the area. They knew no one. Discipleship in action. You know, there's a phrase that I don't like, that if God closes one door, another one will open. I think closed doors is the fact that we are looking and focusing on the wrong thing, wanting to follow and do what we want instead of being open to what God is calling us to do. And when we're looking at a closed door, we're looking at one, we're missing all the others. Discipleship helps us to see more than what's just in front of us. From all of this, what's the point? Well, the point is simple. That if we live a life that glorifies God and invites others to become part of that kingdom, there is a reward at the end of that journey. Mark 10 talks about this in verses 28 through 31. And it's kind of interesting because it's a confrontation. Peter began to say to him, Jesus, look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, truly I tell you, there was no one who, was, who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age. Houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, and children, and fields with persecutions. And in the age come eternal life. The many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. There are times in our journey where we kind of sit there and go, what's the point of all of this? What I like about this passage is Jesus isn't rebuking Peter. In in Peter's confrontation and frustration, he's echoing what the rest of the disciples are saying. And Jesus does not say, sit down, keep your mouth shut, and trust where we go. 
So he appeals to him. He explains it to him. He gives him an understanding of what is to come. Peter is being confrontational, and Jesus is quick to remind his disciples that there is a reward waiting for us in heaven. A community that is without struggle and strife, where those who are rejected, dejected, ignored, hurt, abused, and tortured for the fun of others, will be put in a place of importance and provenance in the eyes of God. It is a response, it is the promise of when Jesus said, come, I will make you fishers of men. Responding to that call comes before the eternal reward is granted, but the reward is there, it is promised. We just have to be a little patient in receiving it. And while we are patient, we are to follow Jesus, learning how to understand and apply to our lives how great our loving God truly is. The very last thing that I want to share with you about discipleship today is taking what we have learned and sharing with others to make other disciples. It is commonly quoted as what's called the Great Commission, found in Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20, where Jesus says to them, With all authority in heaven and on the earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you to the end of the age. In this commission, discipleship changes from a journey of learning and understanding to a journey of action of going forth and sharing with others. It is very easy to pigeon yourself in just study, 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 and learning. But if there is no application, if there is no venue to apply what you have learned, you know, try and succeed, try and fail, the journey whatsoever, then your discipleship is incomplete. Yes, it means to give yourself wholeheartedly. Yes, it means to learn, but it also means to share. Jesus raised the dead. He judged and forgave sins. He performed miracles, spoke a fresh and binding message that revealed God's love for generations to come. He was one of authority. But in this passage, he once more teaches that his authority is not only tied to this world, but is also tied to heaven, to paradise. And for those of us who walk in, are filled with, and share with others the light that can overcome absolute darkness, fear, dread, and doubt, they, we, are called to go and make other disciples. You don't learn how awesome God is and then keep it to yourselves. You share it with the world. This does not mean that as we putter through our everyday lives, that we let, it's, I'm sorry, I read that wrong. This does not mean that as we putter through your everyday life to let God, let others see God in you. Yes, that's part of it. But there is a very pointed, direct, commanding word. Go. Go is a word of intentionality. Go after the lost sheep in the world and make, create, plant seeds, cultivate soil, harvest the good fruit of the Spirit so that others can know what you know. God loves us and sent His Son to be in a relationship with us. In other words, not only you as disciples are needed, but future disciples are needed. And when we do this, we do not do it on our own accord. We don't sit there and say, hey, I have this idea, let me go do this and glorify God. When we do it all by ourselves and all on our own, if you stop and do a true evaluation in who and what you are, you're really glorifying yourself. Because you're not allowing your edges to be broken down and to join in and to be community with others. We'll talk about that in another week.
This kind of leads into the second point of the core value. We value the teachings of Scripture as guidance and leading of the Holy Spirit as we strive to be and make disciples of Jesus Christ our Savior. We take what we've learned and help others recognize and accept God's call and then help them to understand and grow into a Christian life of faith. And when we do this, we are not left on our own because Jesus personally promises to be with us with every step, with every word, with every thought, with every breath, until we stand in his glory in heaven. We are not left alone. We choose whether we want to be alone or not. But he will always be there pouring. We just have to be open to embrace it. A disciple is one who is called to first know Jesus, then follow Jesus, then to make disciples of other nations. In learning to know Jesus, we become like him in our thoughts, in our feelings, in the movements of our daily lives. We then can follow him, be guided by him, be carried by him through thick and through thin, knowing that he is there and that he will reward us in good time. After all, Jesus is not only the good shepherd, Jesus is also the master. Jesus is also our friend. We were not only called to be like him and follow, it also means that we share our faith with everyone under the sun. Now, that doesn't mean that you walk around with your Bible and you shove it up someone's nose. Why do you find that? Have you had someone do that to you? Uh, I went to a very conservative Christian school for a couple of years of my uh, junior high and high school life. And glory be to God, and I have no other way to, to start that, that, this example off, they expected the people to carry their Bibles and put it in people's faces and before saying hello, basically say, you must repent! Now when they did that to me, I went, are you nuts? It was that aggressive where it was about making the numbers, getting a quota, filling their seats. But if we uphold and want to be disciples and make disciples, then instead of making our budgets and filling the fabrics of the pews, it's about making sure we are helping people come and know Jesus that will last them not only for the moment, for the rest of their lives, and then they take that and share it with someone else. It is a beautiful ripple effect that God created inherently in creation. Just drop a pebble in a calm pond and you'll watch it happen. Discipleship is the same way. No, we don't go out there. Sometimes it's simply saying hello. Sometimes it's seeing someone in need and saying, can I help you? Sometimes holding a door. Sometimes it is standing there and doing nothing. Being able to know what tactic to employ when and where. If you allow yourselves, discipleship teaches you that. Discipleship is really the only plan Jesus ever communicated for the church. Making other disciples, growing in our faith so we can share our faith with others, so others can come to know and understand what we know, what we feel, what we experience, is the only plan Jesus ever communicated in his messages in the Gospels. We take it and apply it to another, a number of other disciplines. But if the goal is to not grow the kingdom, making disciples, then it's probably not a good idea to do. As we strive, as we strive to share, as we strive to serve, as we strive to grow the kingdom, we should also be striving to grow in our relationship with God so we can help others do the exact same thing. Which is to truly know, truly recognize, truly embrace, truly imply, and truly share what a loving and awesome God we genuinely have. Would you all pray with me, please?
Loving God, spark a hunger within us. A hunger that cannot be fed by our work. A thirst that cannot be quenched by our hobbies. A need that cannot be filled with impulse retail shopping. It cannot be addressed by sitting there and gossiping and tearing down this world. But give us a hunger and a thirst and a drive and a desire to grow with you, to grow in you, to trust you, to be with you, to be guided by you. Not so that we hold it to ourselves and are selfish, but so that we can share it with others. Because if we're the only ones that have this knowledge and understanding, O oh God, then we are not glorifying you, for you want all of your creation to be offered the opportunity to come and know you and to share eternity with you. Help us to grow as disciples so we can answer the call, grow in our understanding, and share it with the world. Help us to walk with you, O loving God. We ask this all in your son's precious and most holy name. Amen. <coughs> if anyone's feeling just a little stirred and uncomfortable, there's a part of me that wants to apologize, but discipleship is a real thing. And we spend a lot of our times avoiding it. I know that there are habits that I have in my life that do that. So if you're not sure and you want to risk, give me a call. We'll talk about it. We'll try and figure out what the Spirit's saying for you. Our closing song for this evening is number 651, O oh, Master, Let Me Walk With Thee.
And then, you know, in the parable of the sower, there's this idea that, uh, well, we went out and planted the fields and, well, grew the crop, grew the crop, there's a bunch of areas that didn't work, yep, that's it. And what's usually overlooked is that the sower, the sower went out season after season after season and kept throwing the seed in the same place. Do not give up sharing. It'll eventually take root. We like to look at the work of the church as something that starts and something that ends. It's our program mentality that a lot of us have been born and raised with. But if you look at true and genuine discipleship, it's not something that you start and then end. It's something that you start and continue on until God calls you home. The way that I look at passages today that I read in my teenage years, 30 years ago, I have a different understanding and appreciation because my discipleship journey has grown and changed me. That's the way it should be for all of us. That's what our Lord meant. Take what I have learned, apply it. So I will leave you with my customary closing. Take what you've heard. It's actually a parody of the Great Commission. Take what you've heard. Think about it. Pray about it. And if God calls you to, that's my mission. Apply some of it to your lives. Here's the real Great Commission. As you go forth from this place, do not be afraid to let the world know that y'all are children of God. And we have a little lesson for Go in grace. You feel this peace. A great week, everybody. Amen. General dessert stuff. <laughs> <laughs>